Good evening, everyone. My name is Indira. I am a research uh, assistant and a PhD student at the University of Technology, Sydney. Today, I'm going to talk about the carbonation of concrete with high contents of SEM, such as ground granulated blast furnace like and fly ash, in the highlights of current needs uh, in CO2 reduction. And the title of my presentation is The Durability of Low Carbon Concrete Against Carbonation Induced Corrosion Literature Review and Research Needs. The net zero emission plan by 2050 imposes a clear objective to reduce the CO2 emissions for various industries, including cement and concrete industry. According to some estimations, there are around 5 to 8 percent of worldwide emissions that come from this industry. And the anticipated demand for these materials will only grow over the years, as will grow the population worldwide. So, knowing that Klinka is the major source of CO2 emissions, let's look closer at the cement and concrete industry of Australia. As you can see here in this figure that was provided by the VDZ uh, Research Institute in the report from 2021, uh, they here clearly separated all the emissions according to the type. And the first type is dedicated to the process emissions related to production of clinker. And this is the most carbon intensive one that is responsible for more than 50%. It's around 55%. Next one comes from fuel-based processes, or it's called fuel-based uh, emissions. Uh, that are uh, burned to support the process. The last two ones are called indirect emissions. Uh, they come from the demand for electricity and transport. And in the same report, they suggested some of the decarbonization ways that can be implemented in Australia to reach the targets uh, by 2050. In all these areas highlight the possible research needs starting with the uh, zero emission electricity and transport. So they suggest to use more renewable energy and electricity in the production of cement and concrete. In innovative uh, design and construction, they suggest to use more lower carbon concrete and new technologies. They also suggest to continue further innovate concrete. And here um, they suggest to improve the packing density of concrete, for example, or to use more mixtures. And all these require all these uh, improvements will require um, reviewing current standards and codes. They also suggest to use supplementary cementitious materials because if we substitute part of the clinker with some of the SEMs, it will be possible to decrease uh, embodied carbon significantly. They also suggest to uh, investigate and search for new CO2 efficient cements. And here they suggest to use even more SEM, even higher contents of SEM. And it's not only fly ash and ground granulated blast furnace slag, it's also calcined clays and uh, unburnt limestone. So all of this requires further research. They also suggest to uh, look at using green hydrogen. And of course, um, we will have to find out a way how to account for the concrete uh, CO2 uptake. Because not only uh, there are significant emissions during its production, concrete actually can absorb some of the CO2 during its life. And we will look at it closer a bit later. And the last one, all the CO2 that will not be possible to mitigate by any other means will be captured and stored. So, and today's talk will be more about fly ash and ground granulated blast furnace slag, as they are the most commonly used SEMs in Australia, and their impact on various pathways that was described in the report. So, what is low carbon concrete? What is the connection between low carbon concrete and supplementary cementitious materials? And how can it reduce emissions? Concrete with fewer emissions associated with its production uh, than a conventional concrete can be called low carbon concrete. 
Sometimes it is referred to as eco-friendly or green concrete. Supposedly, such concrete has to have similar mechanical characteristics, as well as fresh properties and um, durability properties. But this is where the challenge lies. In other words, it is relatively easy to produce a low carbon concrete by substituting some of the carbon intensive materials by less carbon intensive materials. But in most of the cases, there are various problems with strength, um, other mechanical properties as um, early age strength or um, uh, fresh properties or durability. However, substituting Portland cement by SCM can reduce the imported carbon significantly and at the same time can still provide the required uh, mechanical durability and fresh properties. For example, according to Australian database provided by ALCAS, it's Australian Life Cycle Inventory, as you can see here, they say that general purpose cement produced at plant emits 905 kilograms of CO2 emissions per one ton of cement. And if we look at the environmental product declaration published by the Boral company, Boral is an Australian cement manufacturer, they reported that they can produce cement uh, that has 147 uh, kilograms of CO2 associated with production of one ton of this cement. So, 905 kilograms, 147 kilograms. It's a very significant reduction in imported carbon. And in this case, there would be a very logical question then. If it is possible to reduce emissions just by substituting uh, some of this cement with SEMs, why don't we do it everywhere? The answer is that there are some constraints with uh, SEMs. First one is the availability of SEM. Together, if we put together fly ash and uh, ground granulate blast furnace slag, according to some estimations, we can substitute no more than 15% of current need in cement. So any use of fly ash and slag has to be really efficient. And it also highlights the need to research other supplementary cementitious materials, such as calcine clay and unburnt limestone. Another um, constraint is the prescriptive based requirements and standards. Current Australian standards uh, 3600 uh, for concrete structures and concrete and concrete supply 1379, they specify various characteristics such as compressive strength curing depending on exposure, climatic conditions, uh, fresh concrete properties and mixtures, etc. But they do not specify the minimum cement content directly. However, there are other uh, requirements and standards that specify minimum cement content, such as, for example, this Australian standard 5100.5 from 2017 uh, for bridge design. They specify the cement content as well as uh, some transport authorities, they specify uh, cement content in their specifications. As shown here, uh, it's just one example, uh, one specification called B80. So, according to these specifications, we cannot add more SCM than specified in the standards. And these requirements were based on the research data established decades ago uh, that led to prescriptive based requirements. And so far, they proved to work well. However, there is a need to reduce the CO2 emissions and substituting uh, Portland cement by SEM in higher amounts can help in this case. In other words, with current requirements, we cannot use the full potential of supplementary cementitious materials. And creating performance-based requirements will allow using the, this potential of SEMs and will also help creating the pool for the industry uh, or the push 
to develop even more types of eco-friendly concretes. Finally, the last constraint um, that we're going to talk about today is the impact of fly ash and slag on the durability of concrete. From the perspective of environmental loading, there are three main issues with uh, durability of uh, concrete in Australia. Chloride ingress, sulfate attack and carbonation, in particular carbonation induced corrosion. Adding SCMs can improve resistance of concrete against chloride attack and sulfate attack. However, uh, it has an adverse effect on carbonation. In other words, if we add fly ash and slag, the carbonation rate increases, meaning the process is faster than we want it to be. So, what is carbonation and carbonation-induced corrosion? There are various sources describing uh, the process. One of them is the technical report 17310 uh, from 2019 called carbonation and CO2 uptake in concrete. But in a very simplified way, carbonation is the precipitation of calcite in the pores of concrete um, under relative humidity between 50 and 70 percent that comes from a chain of complex reactions. Carbonation results in decreased alkalinity of concrete medium. Decreased alkalinity uh, of concrete starts deteriorating the protective layer of rebars called depassivation. Here it's important to note that carbonation itself does not deteriorate the mechanical properties of concrete itself. However, uh, carbonation can lead to carbonation-induced corrosion. And for carbonation-induced corrosion to happen, we need few things. Depassivation that comes from decreased alkalinity from carbonation of concrete and presence of moisture and presence of oxygen. And when all of these things are together uh, in the right conditions, the um, rebar starts to corrode, as you can see here on this picture. So uh, where um, corrosion starts to grow, it creates tensions inside the concrete that leads to cracks inside. And these cracks lead to higher possibility of ingress of other um, aggressive chemicals they can lead to bigger cracks, spalling, uh, loss of bearing capacity, and end of service life. How to identify whether, whether the concrete is carbonated or not? There is a test when you uh, split or cut the concrete and spray it with phenolphthalein spray. And if the surface turns into purple or pink, it means the alkalinity is high. So rebars are protected, everything is fine, it is uncarbonated zone. If color doesn't change as shown here, it means the concrete medium has been carbonated already. Another thing is that the carbonation process itself is inevitable. And the only factor that can be influenced in the design is the rate of carbonation meaning how fast the process goes in deeper into the concrete. And when we add fly ash and slag, the rate increases, meaning that there is a higher risk of carbonation uh, to reach the rebars and in the right conditions for carbonation-induced corrosion to start. Now, let's look closer at the factors that affect carbonation rate. Multiple research have been established over the last few decades and it was found that there are several factors that impact carbonation for any concrete mix, with or without SEM. First one is the water to binder ratio. As you can see here, uh, the overall trend is increasing. So it doesn't matter whether the mix has fly ash or doesn't have fly ash, uh, the carbonation is increasing. The same here with decreased water to binder ratio. Uh, carbonation decreased for all types of the mixes, whether it's limestone, slag, or fly ash. Another factor is the curing duration. With longer curing, the carbonation is slower. So, 
It's pretty logical, actually. With longer curing, we have better quality concrete with lower permeability. So the diffusion of uh, CO2 into concrete uh, becomes slower. Another uh, factor is the strength. High the compressive strength, better the resistance of the material uh, for any material to um, get into the concrete. The same for carbonation. And you probably already noticed that the last factor uh, relates to SEM. The higher amount of SEM uh, in concrete, the higher the rate. And it doesn't matter what type of SEM, fly ash, limestone, slag, the trend in general is the same. The more SEM uh, we have, the higher the rate. And to improve performance against carbonation uh, for concrete that has SEM, it will be logical to try to reduce uh, water to binder ratio and increase curing. And if with longer curing, there is a challenge of increasing the time frame of a construction development, which is uh, quite unrealistic, it is possible to reduce water to binder ratio uh, without deteriorating the fresh and the mechanical properties. And it is possible uh, with using admixtures which became more accessible uh, in the last few decades. Moreover, there is some research data that shows a positive potential for using admixtures to decrease the carbonation rate of blended cements. And if we look now at these two graphics, um, a study of concretes with and without fly ash. On the first graph, there are no chemical admixtures. On the first graph, they added superplasticizers and water reducers. And you can see a drastic change in carbonation resistance of concretes with high amount of SCM. And it gives a great potential of introducing even higher amounts of SCM than specified in standards if we use admixtures. So we'll keep all the required um, properties, mechanical, fresh, and durability properties, as well as reducing embodied carbon significantly. Other research needs include the importance of understanding what is the state of the art, what is the current situation. So for this, we need to gather and analyze a lot of existing data, understanding the uh, impact of different conditions, such as relative humidity, accelerated and uh, natural carbonation, uh, amount of SEMs, curing, etc. All of these conditions have to be taken into account. So gather all the information, establish a framework so we can understand and compare and analyze the data. Another need is in establishing a threshold for carbonation rate, some kind of a maximum carbonation rate that can be suggested for the performance uh, best requirements. There are few research papers that suggest such data, but approaches vary from case to case. So further analysis and comparison is needed, as well as comparison to the data from the field. So moving forward, we also need to establish an approach to estimate the carbonation rate. So we could easily calculate carbonation rate and therefore the durability for any concrete mix. And we can understand what is the service life for each of the mix. Then we also need to understand what kind of tests to include in performance-based requirements, whether it's accelerated carbonation test or any other test. For this, we also will uh, have to review the current standards, so we will be able to introduce the performance-based requirements to the standards. And finally, establishing all of this data it will be possible to understand and estimate what is the CO2 uptake in concrete in reality. So we'll have a better understanding of the whole picture of uh, emissions that are associated with the cement and concrete production. To conclude, today I talked about the need to diminish the CO2 emissions of cement and concrete industry of Australia. And one of the ways to do so is to use low carbon concrete with high contents of SCM. Of course, not forgetting about uh, carbon induced corrosion and the impact of SCM on it. To use this strategy, we have to cover some of the research gaps that I talked about today in my presentation. And some of them are listed here. This is it from me today. 
Thank you for your time and attention. I hope you enjoyed it.